Well, I became interested in thalassemia when I had to um, do my national service in the army just after I'd qualified as a doctor. <clears throat> and I ended up in Singapore, and one of my first patients uh, was a young child from Nepal with thalassemia. And um, so when I'd finished in the army, I went to uh, America and started um, working on trying to understand exactly what thalassemia was and um, the basic defects. And um, that led us into uh, some of the first studies on how the blood pigment hemoglobin is synthesized and the defect in thalassemia and then we were able to take that to the molecular level and so on. And when I came back from to the UK um, and moved to Oxford eventually, um, I um, started to be curious about the reasons for why thalassemia was so common. In fact, it turned out to be the commonest one form of thalassemia turned, it turned out to be the commonest inherited disease in, 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 of human beings. And um, it was at that stage that we realized that this particular form was very common in some of the populations in Southeast Asia. And um, so some of my students started to look at the <clears throat> relationship to this form of thalassemia and the frequency of malaria. And um, that was right when the whole interest in this, in this field started. Well, I think we, we focus very much on the reasons why um, different people and different populations <clears throat> are more or less resistant to malaria and um, the um, it's just been really a steady increase in information about the different uh, human genetic systems which have been shaped by malaria and are shaped by malaria um, uh, it started with hemoglobin um, and the hemoglobin disorders and of course there were not just thalassemia, but it turned out that there are se several other hemoglobin disorders which are shaped. And then um, I think the the next uh, uh, I, I had a student, uh, and we were able to start working on how the, at the parasite red cell level at the time when it became possible to culture malarial parasites, particularly val uh, well, for only falciparum. Um, so we started to look at the factors which um, protected against malaria. And that led us into other regions, uh, particularly the blood groups and the different human blood groups which, <coughs> when they change, are protective against malaria. Um, and then, of course, uh, other groups at the same time were looking at metabolic changes in the red cells, particularly glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Um, and then that's expanded further into looking at people's immune defenses against malaria. Um, and. Um, that's become a big subject uh, in itself. So the whole field has, has expanded in all sorts of different directions over this period um, till we now have a, a, a fairly big list of fact factors of all sorts which protect against malaria. And then, of course, in, in, since the human genome was uh, finally sequenced. Um, it's become possible to do total genome studies to look for these factors. 
and um, that's um, that's really only just getting off the ground, but it's it's obviously going to produce a lot more factors. So, what at the beginning we thought was just a couple of genetic oddities, as it were, has made has changed the whole thing into a, a vast field of uh, of variable, very very genetic variability in humans affecting all sorts of systems that do alter the, the uh, protective or more effects of malaria or uh, make people more susceptible to malaria and um, that that's, uh, com has completely changed our thinking about the whole field. Vivax is very important and it's, I think it's been a bit neglected and it's been known for a long time that people who are missing, who have got an absent um, expression of a particular blood group called the Duffy blood group um, are, are, are totally resistant to Vivax and of course that's covered sub-Saharan Africa and in the past, uh, because the, the vivax uh, the parasite um, attaches itself to that blood group um, to get into the red cell. Um, our findings in vivax um, have looked a bit the other way and found that people with um, inherited blood diseases. Um, are more susceptible to vivax because the, the parasite likes young red cells and if you're making more red, red, young red cells than normal it's it become absolutely clear that you're more prone to vivax. Um, and then very recently of course um, there's been a, it's been found that vivax may be able to get into red cells through another receptor and we've been working in Sri Lanka to try to, um, on yet another uh, form of uh, defective red cell which seems to be resistant to Vivax. So I think the story with Vivax is really only just starting, quite honestly. Well, it, one of the other quite remarkable uh, findings over recent years by uh, one of my ex-students, Tom Williams, was that um, these different protective effects like sickle cell anemia and alpha thalassemia, they kind of talk to each other. There's what's called epistatic interactions. If, you, if you've got um, sickle or if you've got alpha thalassemia, you're protected. But if you inherit both of them, the protection is wiped out. Um, and um, I think we're just at the beginning of understanding the effect of these epistatic interactions and how they are altering population and distributions of all these different protective um, uh, polymorphisms. As regards the the the. Vi uh, Palsiparum and Vivax, uh, the, the parasites themselves, of course, it's only just recently begun to become clear from looking at the parasites' ge ge genome themselves that they are extraordinarily variable, and this is starting to give some insights into different forms of resistance like artemisis in. And um, I think that's going to be another extremely valuable area in trying to understand the different f forms of um, and the different reactions to malaria in different populations. Um, so it's the, the genome of the parasite talking to the human genome all the time, and we're just starting to understand that. It's going in two directions, really. Um, it 
perhaps going in the direction of a better understanding of the genetic makeup of the parasites and how, um, uh, I mean, their genomes are constantly changing. And um, so that's going to take us in the direction of better understanding of things like drug resistance and so on. Um, in our field, <coughs> I think, I'm, well, I'm getting old, but you've got to be optimistic when you're getting old. Um, we, uh, our, our field is very much pushing at the moment, uh, trying to um, alter the um, rates of different production of different hemoglobins. And I do see, um, for the longer term future, this distinct possibility that we will be able to um, construct or change the hemoglobin constitution in red cells such as it makes those cells more resistant to malaria. Um, you, you know, that sounds very optimistic, but um, I, I think we, malaria, I, I'm not an expert malariologist, but I think given the, that's so, it's so cunning, that parasite, and it's going to be constantly changing, so that the problems for vaccines and drugs are, are going to be with us for a long time and I do think we probably need this different approach can we alter the patient's genetic makeup if you like uh, to try to try to produce a more even even moderate degree of resistance to malaria